Uh, and uh, we'll read down through verse number 38. I want to preach to you tonight on strengthen thy brethren. Strengthen thy brethren. And I want to encourage you tonight. I believe Christ here is trying to encourage the disciples, specifically Peter, and uh, gives him an instruction to strengthen his brethren. Begin in verse number 31. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And you stop and you say, man, that sounds kind of discouraging, but look at verse number 32 because that is a discouraging thought, but the reality is he is trying to encourage him, and he says, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, this is Jesus, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And I love their response. Every one of them. They said, that's all of the disciples. They said nothing. We didn't like We liked no thing. Nothing at all. Then said he unto them, but now... He that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. In me. And he was reckoned among them, uh, among the transgressor, for the things concerning me have an end. And, and if you know the Word of God, and you can read it a little few chapters, just a couple chapters uh, uh, further in the book of Luke and in the Gospel record, Certainly, the life of Christ would end physically here on this earth. Mm-hmm. But praise God, He rose again yeah. to give us hope of eternal life. Mm-hmm. Amen. And in verse number 38, it says, And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And He said unto them, It is enough. Tonight, I want to preach to you about the sufficiency of Christ in some uncertain times. And I want you to understand that Christ has everything we need. And He is everything Amen. we need. Yeah. We can have our, find our sufficiency in Him to face the battles of our day and to strengthen our brethren. Let's yeah. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank You for the next few moments as we've opened Your Word and we've read from Your Word. And God, we know that it's Your Word that changes lives tonight. It's not mine. I pray that Your Holy Spirit would guard my mouth. And Lord, that You would help me to preach that which would be profitable to this assembly. And uh, Lord, I pray that Your Spirit uh, would allow me to uh, bring light to the Word of God and not to just promote my own thoughts, but that everything I say would be a promotion of the thoughts of your word. And uh, God, we'll just be glorified if you would come down and meet with us tonight. That's our desire. And we'll just praise you when it does happen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Again, Jesus is trying to encourage Peter uh, that there was that there is hope and that there would be hope. Uh, because soon he's going to go through some very uncertain days. He's getting ready to go through some very uncertain times, and if you uh, understand or have read the whole Gospels, and I encourage you uh, to uh, be reading the Word of God, but in, in the Gospel accounts, we realize that it's uh, not going to be very short time at all as they're going to leave, as they're in the upper room right now in this passage of Scripture, they're going to leave the upper room, they're going to go down to the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're going to pray, or Christ rather, is going to pray through the night. His disciples are going to be sleeping while they should be praying. And uh, they're going to uh, leave the Garden of Gethsemane, and as they're on their way back into the city of Jerusalem, uh, they're going to be met by Judas and the Roman soldiers there, and Judas will betray him with a kiss. And I just can't even think about that story without stopping and and remembering what the book of John says about uh, the account as they came up to Christ, and they said, Are thou Jesus is Nazareth? And he said, I am he, and I love it how when he said, I am he professing himself to be God. Am I not on? Am I not on? I'm already into this. All right, here we go again. From the beginning. Luke and chapter. No, we'll start. No, no, but as he as he was talking to the disciples, is that better? Some of you are shaking your heads. Now you're with me. I was wondering where y'all were at. But as he, 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 he's, uh, as he says, I am he, it's a 
declaration of His deity that He is the I Am. And when He professes to those men that He is the I Man, that the I Am and those men were the ones that were going to take Him and bind Him and bring Him into that mock trial that they had. And uh, as He said those words, they all fell right down on their back because they didn't have power to bind Christ. Jesus Christ gave Himself up for you and for me and to save our souls and be in the will of God. He gave Himself up to those Roman soldiers. But the Lord is having this last conversation before that takes place, before He's taken, before He is beaten, before He is spit upon, before right. He is scourged, before He's hung on a cross to die for our sins right. and rise again out of the grave. Yeah. Amen? Before that happens, He's having this last conversation with His disciples there in the upper room. <clears throat> And as he's having this conversation with his disciples, look at what they're thinking about in verse 24. Here he's sharing, hey, this is my body that's going to be broken for you. This is uh, my blood that is going to be shed for you. And, and he's trying to help them understand the importance of his sacrifice and that which he's going to do. And look what they were all worried about. And it says, and there was strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? I mean, after Christ has, has told them multiple times through the gospel record of His death, His burial, and resurrection, and just now right before it takes place as He demonstrates that and, and with that, uh, that time of communion uh, with them, and He uh, has uh, again and reinforced that, that idea in them, uh, they were kind of having their own thoughts and their own ideas about what God was going to do, and, and uh, they uh, just didn't ever listen to what Christ was trying to tell them, uh, and they were more concerned not about the plan of God and not about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but their main concern was which of them was most important. Uh, their main concern was which of them was uh, going to be accounted the greatest, and Jesus is real quick, I don't have time to preach it all, but Jesus is real quick to correct them and, uh, and to try to help correct their thinking that uh, this life and His kingdom uh, was not about them and uh, the, the, the kingdom was not to be their focus at this point in time. But what was important is that they would emulate Christ and be servants one right. to another as right. He was a servant unto them and how He did not come to be served but to be a sacrifice right. and to be a, a, a Savior for us. As Christ corrects them in the book of Matthew and Mark, if you go over there and read this same story, uh, He says unto them, after He corrects them about their thinking, He says, listen to me, all of you will be offended at Me this night. All of you will be offended at Me this night. He tells all of the disciples there in the upper room that, and, and as they are, uh, as He's conversing uh, uh, with them, and, and uh, they don't seem to know what He's talking about because they're just thinking, no, we're going we're gonna to triumphantly walk into your kingdom here real soon. Not... Not be offended, not leave you, but we understand that that's exactly what happens. They would all turn away from him, right. and we right. understand that uh, that they would uh, they would fall away, if you will, in a, in a sense. Uh, not that they uh, uh, totally fell away from Christ or they lost their salvation. I thank the Lord for the eternal security we have in Christ, but all of them would fail, if you will, a little bit in their faith. And falter a little bit in their faith. And at a point in time where uh, they needed somebody to stand up and speak up for the Lord, they were going to be silent. Right. The only thing that anybody recorded was saying was denying who he was, denying what he was, and denying that they knew him at all. That's the only record of anything coming from the mouths of the disciples. And it came from the mouth of one Peter. It was Simon here in the book of Luke. And not only that, would they all fall away then, but we even know that if you go over to the book of John in chapter 21, and days after Christ even rose from the grave and He met with them, and He let Thomas touch His side and touch the, the piercings in His hand. Uh, over in John 21, uh, after Jesus already met with him, they, Paul Peter throws his hands up and says, listen guys, I go fishing. I go fishing. I'm going back to the old life. I'm going back to the old way. I'm going back to the way things used to be. And Jesus, even knowing that, if you look in Matthew and Mark's Gospel again, He, he says, listen, I'm going to go before you into Galilee in Mark in chapter 14, verse 28. He said, I, I know you're going to fall away. I know you're going to falter. I know you're going to go through some times of struggle. Uh, but I'm going to go before you into Galilee. He already knew what was going to take place over in John 21. He's going to meet with him there. Jesus understood the, the tripping up and the offense that was going to take place in their lives but Peter here in our text, and Luke is the only gospel that addresses Peter directly. Uh, here in our text, Peter 
is kind of the spokesman for the disciples, and he just uh, is like most men. He can put his foot in his mouth really good, amen. And uh, on this occasion, he he just does that. And you can go through the Gospels. There's many times uh, when Peter just put his foot right in his mouth. And Matthew 16 always stands out in my mind as one of those times after professing to, to for the disciples stands up in the midst of it and says, uh, when Jesus said, "Whom do men say that I am?" and he just speaks up and says, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." And and Christ praises him for that. And then Christ goes on to start speaking about the gospel and Peter stands up again and says not so Lord and uh, Jesus looks at him and says get thee behind me Satan and he just stuck his foot right in his mouth and just kept on swallowing John in chapter 6 and verse number 68 as uh, Christ was uh, telling uh, uh, the crowds that were following him the, the large crowds he, he looked at them and he said listen unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood uh, thou shall have no part of me and and the crowds not understanding what he was saying and not understanding he was speaking of the sacrifice that they were going to have to receive of his body and of his blood that they just pictured here in this time of communion. Uh, if they weren't willing to receive him, they couldn't be his disciple. And certainly that's true tonight. If you're not willing to uh, receive Christ, I don't care what you call yourself. You don't stand in the garage and call yourself a car and it is so. And you don't just call yourself a Christian. No, you're a Christian if you know Christ and follow Christ and emulate Christ. That's what makes you a Christian. And uh, here we see as the multitudes turned away because they didn't understand what Christ was saying. And they don't want to spend time to understand what Christ is saying. Uh, here we see uh, he looks at the disciples and Peter kind of is the spokesman once again for them, if you will. And, and uh, Jesus says, will you two go away? Will you also go away? And he just said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Uh, and I'm telling you what, there might be some times in your life when you're coming to church and, man, you say, I just don't understand this and I don't understand that. But I, I want you to know that even in times of uncertainty, He has the words of life and He is the way of life. And I want to encourage you, just keep following Christ. Yeah. Keep following Christ. And here, Christ begins to talk, I believe, to the entirety of the disciples, but singling out Peter here. He says, Peter... Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, I don't know how much you all know about the word sifting. I don't know if that's something that makes sense to you even. But uh, I, I uh, grew up in the great state of Kansas. Amen. We're the number one seed. Praise the Lord. In the NCAA tournament. They won tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. None of you are all excited about this at all. But you should be. You should be. And uh, But growing up in the great state of Kansas, i got to grow up around a whole lot of wheat fields. Amen. And uh, you could uh, watch your dog run away for a month or two. That's what they say anyway. But uh, you just keep going off into the sunset. Amen. And uh, But uh, growing up in Kansas, got to be around wheat. And, and we understand how they, can set, they want to separate uh, the wheat. We do things a lot differently in our day uh, when it comes to separating wheat out. But they'll beat the wheat out of the out of the stalks and out of the shaft and then they separate it. And uh, but when I think about the word sifting, I, I think about more of a refining process. Uh, when you think about the word sifting, my mom used to uh, used to make bread when I was growing up, and she made some of the best bread. My brother's here tonight; he knows it. I'm not lying; he can testify for me in a minute if he needs to. But uh, my, as I go to the Larry Clayton always said uh, that his mama's bread was so good if you put it on the top of your head, your tongue would beat your brains out trying to get to it. Right? It was that good. And uh, and so my mom, when she would make bread, she would take a sieve and she would pour flour in it. Most of us. I mean, when we think of baking, you know, we're like, we go down to Safeway and, yeah. you know, or some grocery store. You mentioned Walmart. We, we just buy our baked goods, you know, pre-made, you know. But she would take flour and she would pour it in a sieve. And then she'd sit there and she'd tap that sieve and allow the flour to come out of this uh, of this screen mesh. And uh, she was trying to make sure that it was very fine, that there were no uh, small clumps in it, that it was refined and that it was, it was, it, it was just right. Right. And this is the analogy that uh, Christ gives to Peter of what God is, uh, what's getting get ready to take place in his life, and what God's going to allow in his life, because Satan had a desire to sift him as wheat. My mind goes to the story of Job when I think about that, and as uh, Job uh, in his life, uh, you understand, God allowed uh, some things to happen in Job's life, and and the devil began to work on Job's life, but Job always came back to this constant that he knew God was in control. 
Right. And, and although Job lost everything he had, he lost his land, he lost his wealth, he lost his family. I, I mean, he lost everything. All he had left was a few good friends and an encouraging wife, amen, who just said, Job, curse God and die. Right. I mean, with, with support like that, how could you go wrong, amen? Right. And Job just had this constant in his life that he knew God was going to be enough. And he knew, he, so yeah. he knew that God was going to be in control and, and he would not curse the name of the Lord because he knew that uh, his Lord and his God was going to make things right and was going to, uh, whether he left this life with nothing. Listen, he knew his Lord was in control. Yeah, and he, we find out in the story of Job that Job lived a life and gave us a testimony that he knew where his sufficiency lied in. It wasn't in his possessions, and it wasn't in his family, and it wasn't in his, in his wealth. But my friend, it was in the God of heaven. Yeah. And that's where his sufficiency Amen. lied. Amen. And here as Jesus is talking unto Simon Peter, he says, Listen, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. And, and uh, as he says those things, I mean, I can almost see Peter in verse number 33 just kind of pounding his chest and, and once again going, Not so, Lord! No, no, no. That, this isn't the guy that's going to get sifted as wheat. This isn't the guy that's going to be fallen. This isn't the guy that's going to be discouraged. Yea, all shall forsake you. I'm not going to forsake you, Lord. I'm not going to be turning my back on you. I'm willing to go to prison if need be. And even further than that, I'll give my life if I have to. I'm not turning my back. Jesus is very clear with him. Verse 34, he says, no, Peter, that's not the way it's going to go. That's not the way it's going to go down. Uh, I, I'm the Alpha, the Omega. I know the beginning from the end. Yeah. That's not the way it's going to happen. No, Peter, before the cock crows twice this morning, you're going to deny you even know me three times. You're going you're gonna to try to distance yourself from me as far as you can possibly get. <clears throat> and then Christ seems like he's just kind of shifting gears. I'm kind of moving fast because I need to get to our point. In verse number 35 and 36... He says, listen, when you guys were out ministering in the, this world while I was here, did you lack anything? And they, they all said, no, we didn't like any, nothing. We liked nothing. And, and, and then he goes on in verse number 36 and he, 37. He says, okay, well, that's true. I want to explain to you that things are going to be changing now. Things are going to be different now. I'm not going to be with you any longer. You can go over to John 14 and 15. You can read about how Jesus said, listen, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you another comfort that will teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have commanded you. But it's just going to be different now because I'm no longer going to be with you. And he said, when, when you went out before, you, you were told not to take anything with you. Don't take money. Don't take your purse. Don't take your script. And some of those men said, well, praise the Lord, I didn't want to carry a purse anyway. I'm glad God kind of shifted gears there a little bit. Amen. I see some hands. Testing is fine. No, but really, uh, uh, listen, he says, you, those weren't things you were supposed to take. But, now I'm telling you, you can go ahead and get some money, go get some script, and, and if you don't have a sword, go ahead and sell your cloak and, and you go buy one because things are going to be a little different. You're getting ready to enter some times of uncertainty. And you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared. I, I believe Christ is talking here literally, but I, I think primarily He's trying to get across to them a spiritual truth here. Primarily, I believe that's what He's trying to say. You say, why do you say that? Because in, uh, in verse number 38, they go and find two swords among them. Remember, there's 11 of them, and two of them bring swords, and they say, here, here's two swords, and uh, we're ready, we're prepared, we're, we're, I mean, we're ready to go, we're ready to die, we're ready to give our all for you. And He just says... It's enough. And the reason I say it's kind of a spiritual, because I'm not too bright, I'm not that great at math, but I do know that there were 11 of them. That meant nine of them didn't have a sword yet. Right. They weren't prepared. They were not ready. Right. And Christ was trying to help them realize that <clears throat> you can get as prepared as you want. There's still going to be some times of uncertainty. Right. But even in times of uncertainty, I want you to remember that you have never lacked anything. Yes. When you've been in my service, yeah. you've never lacked a thing when you've followed me and when you've listened to me and when you've been obedient to my commands. There's never been a time, there's never been a thing that you've needed that I have not provided Amen. for you. You've been able to find sufficiency in me. Yeah. Grew up in, again in Kansas, and 
in Kansas, you know, we have some drills we do in school. You remember going to school, and maybe you might remember you did fire drill. You remember that when you were growing up in school, and, and uh, the teacher would say, okay, uh, we're going to have a fire drill today, and uh, we're going to uh, leave class, and all the boys said, praise the Lord. I mean, because, uh, you know, we got out of the study, and we got out of the work, and all the girls were going, oh, I can't read my book, and the boys were like, yeah, I can't read anyway, you know, and, and uh, we got to go out, and they, they would march us out in a single file line, and they take us uh, somewhere out, maybe in the, in the playground, or sometimes there might be uh, a designated area. Area, if you will, when I was in uh, when I was in high school growing up, we had fire drills and we got an extra blessing as kids. We had tornado drills too. I mean, this is what you this is what you do in a tornado. I mean, wonderful. More more time out of class. Praise the Lord. Thank you for all these disasters we're going through. And, and we went through times of preparation for things that might happen that are uncertain. Went through times of preparation. We got ready because the truth is that even in times when people are prepared for things that are traumatic and that are hard, even if they're prepared, they might just lose their mind That's a right. little bit. We got to work as a chaplain with the police department, and, and it was amazing that uh, people would go through some traumatic events and some traumatic circumstances, and uh, they'd make it through just fine, and, and, and a little bit of space of time after that traumatic event, maybe a car accident, uh, maybe a fire or something like that in their home, and... Uh, and, and they, they almost like they just would wake up. And, and, and they'd look around and they'd say, what, what just happened? What's going on? I, I mean, it's like they were functioning through it. They were going through it. I mean, uh, I mean it was reality of what was going on. And they were, I mean, they were walking and they were talking and they were involved, but they weren't really even there. They were just kind of just going through the motions because they weren't really prepared. I want you to understand, and I, I just buzzed through those scriptures. There's a lot more that could be said, publicly <coughs> be said, but I, I want to be respectful of my time. I, I want you to understand that you need to be prepared for times of uncertainty. <coughs> they are going to happen in your life. Right. There will be times in your life, and I, I can't imagine that you... Uh, been walking with the Lord at all for any period of time, uh, that you haven't come to a circumstance and just gone, well, what in the world's going on? What's happening, Lord? What are you? What are you doing? I, I mean, I mean, really, where you just kind of a, a, are questioning where where the Lord is leading and what God is doing, and and and, and how in, how in the world is this going to work out for your honor and your glory? We stop and we have times of uncertainty <coughs> in our lives. We can almost be as Peter, where Jesus said uh, in verse number. Uh, if you look back up there in verse number thirty-two, or thirty, um, yeah, verse number thirty-two. She says, but I have prayed for thee, Peter. You're going to be sifted as wheat. You are going to trip up. You're going to, uh, you're going to uh, falter a little bit. But I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. The word fail means to become deficient, to be insufficient, to cease to be abundant for supply. That's what the word means. There'll be times sometimes in our lives where, just as Peter, where we can be uh, going in the right direction. We, we feel like, man, we're just going with the rest of the crowd. I've been at church. I've been doing all the things that all the other disciples have been doing. And, and, and I'm kind of a leader. I mean, he was kind of a leader among them and was always opening his mouth and sometimes saying the right thing, most of the time saying the wrong thing. But, man, he was part of the crowd. He was part of the disciples. He was right in the right place that he was supposed to be. But there was coming a trial that he was not prepared to face and, and some hardships that he was not ready for and, and, and if you can get this idea when it talks about, about failing not and being unsufficient, it, it's almost as if he kind of just, if you will, if, if you picture with me Christ, then he just kind of turns away. Uh, then he just kind of just kind of steps away for a moment and, and stops and ponders what's going on. I, I don't know if you've had any times of your life like that. I remember August 6th of 2014. August 6, 2014, uh, I, I mean, it's a day that's impressed upon my mind. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'll ever forget that morning. It was just after, uh, or just before, rather, 9 o'clock. I got in my truck, and I praise the Lord, I get to drive a truck because I'm a man, amen. And I uh, got my truck, and I was heading to work. I was going to the church office. And my kids were outside in our front yard, and, and uh, I park up at the top of our driveway, and our house kind of sits down in a depression. 
uh, uh, and uh, I was uh, looking down at the yard there my wife was and our five children and praise God for them and they're playing with the dog out in the front yard and and uh, we were just sitting there and I was uh, I mean the sun was shining and uh, it's just a beautiful place northwest the Pacific Northwest in the summertime probably no beautiful place in the world uh, other than that it's just a gorgeous place to live and I was sitting there and, and honestly I was sitting there thinking about how good God is and how blessed I am. It's what I was sitting there thinking about. And I put my car in drive and I began to pull forward. And as I began to pull forward, I heard a sound that just wasn't right. I just heard a noise and I thought, my goodness, that just, that's just not the way it normally sounds. And I looked in my rear view mirror and I saw a little pile of uh, 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 laying there in the middle of the road. And it was my youngest son, Bradley. I take my truck and I drove right over the top of him and I, I jumped out of the truck and I ran back to him and my wife came running up out of the yard and I said, what, what happened? She, I don't know. I turned around. He was gone and, and I, we, she's picked him up and I could already see there was blood coming through his little white t-shirt and, and, uh, and, and she's, she's crying and Bradley's screaming and we don't know what in the world's going on. I said, Get, go inside. Just go inside. And, and, and uh, I got her inside and I turned around and I just began to dry heave. I mean, I was just down on my knees. I was just being just dry heaving like I was going to throw up. Thinking in my mind, I just killed my son. It was a horrible feeling. We got in the car. I, I, I kind of came to myself a little bit. We got down to the, to, the, um, to the hospital, and they did all sorts of x-rays. And praise the Lord, there's nothing wrong. He lived. I, 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 don't, know, I, I don't know other than the hand of God that he's alive today. I don't, I don't know anything other than that. But i, I got to tell you, for, for a few seconds there, as I was dry heaving out in front of my house, I, th I thought, Lord, what in the world is going on? We were just sitting here talking to each other about how good you are. This wasn't supposed to happen today. This was a good day. Our faith sometimes can just fail a little bit. We can ask God, what are you, what are you doing? Why? Why? Uh, why would I have to go through that? But you understand, even in times like that, God does not cease to be good. Because he said in verse 32, I pray for you that faith fail not. And when thou art converted, when thou art turned or changed from one state to another, that's what converted means, strengthen thy brother. Would you come help me, Rick? This is my brother, Rick. He pastors in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He said, listen, when you had those times when you kind of just turn around, and, and I think Peter and all the disciples, they were right there. They, did, they had their own mentality, their own idea about what God was going to do, but they got to a place where they were like, I don't know what's going on anymore. I, I just don't know what in the world's going on. And, and I'll just say this real quick. If they had been paying attention to Christ as they should be, they know exactly what's going on. The problem was they weren't paying attention to where Christ was going and what Christ was saying. But when we've had those times when we know, you know what, I, I fail a little bit, but you know what? I realized that I keep my eyes on Him. I realized that even, even though I don't understand what's going on, my sufficiency is still on Him and in Him. And He said, listen, when you're converted, when you've turned, turned this corner, when you've turned things around, I want you to strengthen the brethren. Because the truth is that there isn't a person here that can't go through a time of uncertainty almost any given day of the week. It might be tomorrow for you and it might be Monday for somebody else. But I'll tell you what's needed is not for us to look down and say, I knew they, didn't, I knew they weren't going to make it. I, I knew they were going to fall. I knew they were going to fail. I knew they weren't the real deal. No, what needs to take place is we need to strengthen them. Sadly, there's a lot of people that they don't want strengthened, but I tell you what, as, as the children of God, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, our desire, our heart, should be to strengthen one another. Right. And, and strengthen means this quickly. It means to set fast. It, it means to come up and, listen, I, I know you're going through a trial. Mm -hmm. Can I encourage you what God's done in my life? Amen. I was out here witnessing just a little while ago. I was passing out tracks and I said, hey, I'm going uh, to invite you to church on the back of that track and just... People walking by. You know how they do, just walking by as fast as they can go, wanting to not even look you in the eye. Mm -hmm. And he said, on the back of that track's the gospel. It changed my life when I was 18 years old. Would you read it? 
I mean, it literally changed my life when I when I received Jesus Christ. Would you read the gospel? Right. But you know, you're the testimony. I can share how, listen, this happened in my life, but I tell you what, God was faithful, God was sufficient, God was able. Mm -hmm. So just keep your eyes on Christ. Yeah. You just keep looking at Christ. Don't, don't turn away from Him. I'll tell you what, just, just yeah. turn Him aright. Yeah, that's, that's what it says. That's what, that's what it means. Uh, strengthen, it means to set fast, to, uh, to turn resolutely towards Christ. Yeah. Towards Christ. It means this. To confirm. Listen, I know that's hard. I know this, I know this trial, this tragedy, this, this experience you're going through, it's hard, it is difficult. But I do know this that you cannot rely on you. Yeah, right. But if you'll turn to him, yeah, he has everything you need. And the honest truth is that even in your darkest day, you will lack nothing yeah. if you'll find your sufficiency yeah, in him. And this is what Christ would want us to do is, is to turn people back to Him and strengthen them and, and confirm them. And, and this is what it means. Just lean back on my hands. Trust me. This is my brother, so he doesn't have much trust. <laughs> but do you get it? Strengthen them. Give them somebody to lean on. Don't, don't let them wallow down here in the mess and the trouble. Yeah, that's, oh man, you poor thing. And Yeah, oh, I know it's hard. And, yeah, I've had trials too, and, and God's done me the same way. No, 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 no. Yeah, Listen, it was a mess. Yeah, that's right. But God's good. That's right. He's yeah, sufficient. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you what, I'm going to stand here and hold you up for a while if you need it. Amen. Strengthen thy brethren. Amen. Strengthen thy brethren. Yeah. I, I submit to you tonight that in the house of God, we, didn't, we don't need pessimists. Yeah. There, there's enough of those out in the world. They can go to work and find people that will yeah. listen to them complain all day long and, right. and will moan and gripe and, and complain about God. No, 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 no. I want you to know that God's sufficient. And you need to allow Him to strengthen you and allow Him to use you to strengthen others yeah. in times of uncertainty in their life. God is good. Let's pray. Dear Father, God, we thank you so much for your love. God, I thank you that you are sufficient.